SpaceX is feeling the heat from multiple angles as they work hard to place their Mars rocket into orbit. Elon revisits his Starship plans for Starlink. The military launches their first payload on a reused Falcon 9. SpaceX's new ship gets in on the action, and we finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. Progress continues as SpaceX builds their first orbital Starship and the support equipment needed to get it there. Booster 2 is still undergoing its growth spurt, mating with several more rings this week, some of which included the aft section that will later be mated with Raptor engines. In total, 35 Raptors will be needed for this first orbital flight, 29 for the first stage booster, and 6 for the second stage Starship, SN20. Those engines are being built at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California at the rate of one per every 48 hours. And it's where President Gwen Shotwell gave her graduation speech this week to students of Northwestern University. But Starship fans online were quick to notice the monitor behind Shotwell and immediately began deciphering and speculating the message of the cropped and blurry screenshots. Well, after staring at these myself for a few minutes, squinty and cross-eyed, I believe I can interpret them for those of you still left in confusion. The screen writes, Starship orbital launch engines shipped, followed by 25 days, 7 hours, and 30 minutes. It also includes two diagrams. The one on the left is the Raptor layout for the Super Heavy booster. The one on the right, the Starship Raptor configuration. This monitor displays how many engines Hawthorne engineers have built and shipped for the upcoming Starship Super Heavy orbital mission. The white circles are the engines yet to be sent out. The green circles are the ones that have already been checked off. These engines have been sent to McGregor for testing. From there, they could either come back to Hawthorne if irregularities have been encountered, or they could be sent to Starbase for future integration with Starship. At least two engines, SN72 and 74, have already made it there, so 33 more to go. So unfortunately, this monitor does not indicate a countdown for the orbital launch itself. It's just a countdown to get all 35 Raptors out the door and on their way to McGregor, Texas. SpaceX was originally targeting July for liftoff, but I think it's safe to say we'd be lucky to see it fly as early as August. Even for that, I'm skeptical. Yesterday, BN 2.1 was cryo-tested for a second time, this time to failure. No word yet on what bar it reached. Ground support equipment still needs to be completed, but crews are working their bootays off to make it happen. Since our previous episode, more cryo-stored shells have been moved into their proper places, and the orbital launch towers, fourth and fifth segments, that were transported to the launch site last week have been stacked and secured in place. Starship 16 has been officially sidelined. This week, crews moved it out of the high bay to a new display stand next to SN15. However, Elon did tweet that they might use it on a hypersonic flight test. I think I speak for everyone when I say, yes, please. I want to thank the usual suspects, Lab Padre, RGV Aerial Photography, John Randolph, Starship Gazer, and everyone else who has sent me what they captured going on down there at Starbase. Even the Border Patrol is excited about it, sending me some pics during their time off. A lot of my viewers are law enforcement and active duty military and veterans. Some even work at SpaceX and NASA now. So shout out to all you freedom loving patriots. And of course, shout out to Elon for providing us all with some awesome behind the scenes views like this panel from the high bay. Righteous bra. Next time, base jump off that beast. Wah! But while most of us are having a good time watching the local activities, some are quite perturbed by it. A local nonprofit, Save RGV, sent a letter to the Cameron County judge responsible for approving SpaceX's closures of Highway 4, outlining multiple violations SpaceX and the county has committed since their September 2013 Memorandum of Agreement with the Texas General Land Office, as well as with the 2014 Record of Division by the FAA basically stating that SpaceX has already maxed out its 300-hour highway closure limit this year, and therefore the group is requesting that the county cease issuing any further orders. The county is currently working with the FAA to determine whose problem this really is and what they can do about it. I'll keep you all updated as more intel is released. Obviously, I think it would be best for everyone if all parties were more flexible. I think ceasing all transport down Highway 4 for the year is a ridiculous request. After all, this is our nation's most advanced rocket manufacturer, but so is also allowing SpaceX to shut her down whenever they feel like it, which isn't actually the case according to the county. They say they deny requests from SpaceX a lot. And maybe that's why Elon wants to incorporate Starbase, to have an evil monopoly on the only road that runs through the area. That way, nobody can enjoy the beach without getting through him first. That's not how that works. You're an idiot. But environmentalists aren't the only ones coming after SpaceX. Local authorities are threatening to arrest any of their employees or contractors that continue to block the smaller side streets around Starbase. Security staff has allegedly broken Texas laws by impersonating public officials, a third-degree felony, and obstructing public roads, a Class B misdemeanor. 
A Cameron County District Attorney wrote a letter to SpaceX warning them that if it doesn't stop, the company itself will face criminal prosecution. Stop! I said stop! But wait, we're not finished yet. The Verge broke another story concerning the drama between SpaceX and the Federal Aviation Administration surrounding the premature launch of SN8 last December. According to a five-page report by SpaceX and other internal letters, SpaceX employees were aware that the FAA was warning them that if they launched their first Starship to 10 clicks without their authorization, they could lose their launch license. The FAA's model was showing that if the rocket exploded, it would create a shockwave strong enough to endanger nearby homes when amplified by the weather. SpaceX's launch control personnel left the meeting with the government agency to resume the launch countdown anyway, assuming the FAA inspector didn't have the latest information. And as we all know, SN8 did explode, but no homes were destroyed. And so that's why the FAA investigated the incident, and they couldn't determine whether or not the violation was intentional, and also why Congress called for a hearing to make sure nobody was bullying the poor federal regulators, and why SpaceX now has to have an FAA babysitter on site in Boca Chica for all future launches. However, to their credit, the FAA did defend SpaceX at their congressional hearing, quote, we would not have cleared them to start flight operations again had I not been confident that they had modified their procedures effectively and addressed the safety culture issues that we saw. I don't know, maybe it's the large sums of money Elon and SpaceX has at their disposal, or the fact that they're the only ones in America currently giving the government a ride to space. But they've been flexing some pretty major testicles at Uncle Sam lately. Thug life. We've known for a couple years now that SpaceX wants to use Starship to deploy about 400 Starlink satellites at a time as soon as they can manage it. And Elon has once again confirmed that's still the plan. When asked about the 53 degree orbital path they normally launch to from Florida, Elon responded that after several successful launches of Starship, taking the rocket over land earlier in its flight path will pass the risk assessment threshold. But with that said, Starship will also launch from Florida long term. We haven't had any Starlink launches in a while, but we did have the launch of Space Force's fifth GPS-3 mission yesterday. And it was the first time the military ever used a recycled rocket to deliver their cargo. So score one for the American taxpayer. That money saved can now be wasted elsewhere. This booster was previously used on the fourth GPS-3 mission, and the military's faith in the rocket paid off, delivering their payload to orbit without incident. And the booster made a slightly off-center, but still thrilling landing on the drone ship. Just read the instructions. To the right, to the right, to the right. And it even kept the drone ship feed this time. <laughs> yeah! ah! Ah! Yes! This was the first mission for SpaceX's new ferrying recovery ship, Haas Briarwood. What up, Haas? Captured here by Greg Scott. The ship is a loner and will likely not be sticking around long term. The next launch is slated for June 24th and will be SpaceX's second dedicated rideshare mission, Transporter 2. And now it's time for today's honorable mention. Today we're discussing a few different topics currently making the rounds, so we're going to briefly hit up each one. NASA has taken their next step toward revisiting the moon. This week they integrated the SLS's center core booster with its solid rocket side boosters in the VAB building at Cape Canaveral. This will be the first SLS to launch, and it will do so with an Orion capsule on top, taking it on an orbital trip around the moon with a dumbass inside. This mannequin dummy will sit in the commander's seat and will measure the vibrations of the rocket. Blue Origin CEO Jeffy has announced that he will be riding on the first New Shepard rocket to fly people across the Kármán line on a suborbital trajectory. He, his brother Mark, and an anonymous bidder, who paid $28 million to sit between the two in a small confined space, will strap in or strap on for an exhilarating experience on July 20th. <laughs> Does that look a little odd to you? <laughs> <laughs> the bidder's identity will be revealed in the coming weeks, and they will be joined by a fourth person to be announced soon. And I hope that's not you, because there's currently a petition to prevent Jif from returning to Earth. But not to worry, they'll need a much flamier phallus to make that happen. Okay. <laughs> Jif. Okay, all right. Virgin Galactic may try to upstage Blue Origin with an earlier launch of their CEO, Richard Branson, aboard a Spaceship 2 vehicle. The company just completed the third successful launch and flight of their rocket space plane last month, and are now looking to take private passengers on suborbital joyrides above the American version of the Carmen line. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Thanks for tuning in. Shout out to my eccentric members and patrons for supporting the channel, as well as all of you who support by purchasing my eccentric shirts and mugs. We do have a couple new eccentric patches available now as well. My mommy makes them. Get yours now by using the link below this video. 
Have a nominal weekend, and until next time, Godspeed. Well, never in my life did I think that one day I would be educating NASA on anything, but here we are. This week they put out a video supporting equity, which is a very un-American and dangerous idea. I explained what it is and how it's a threat in my message today. You can find it here as well as a link in the description below this video. I'll see you there.